to welcome you to another edition of our studies on the book of Romans. And today we are studying Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. And as we continue in Romans, we see that the Apostle Paul is continuing to unpack the gospel. But he's doing so in such a way that he's starting with the sinfulness of humanity that all human beings are under the wrathful judgment and punishment of God, under his condemnation. And so we saw in back in chapter 1 how Paul talked about how the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of humans uh, who, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And, and so we saw that Paul opens with the wrath of God. And we're going to see that phrase again in chapter 2. So keep that in mind. Why is the wrath of God being revealed against the unrighteousness of men? Well, Romans 1 continues. Verse 21 says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, and their futile hearts uh, became darkened, and they were foolish. And so verse 20 says that humans are anapologitos, anapologitoi, which means that they are without defense, they are without excuse, without apology. And as we said, it, that word literally means they are without legal defense before God. And so Paul is, is binding everyone under the reality of, of sin and under God's condemnation. And so let's take a look at the last verse of chapter 1, verse 32, and it says, Though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things, let's remember that word practice, it's the word praso in the Greek, those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who who practice them. Again, the same verb, praso, in the Greek. And so as we come into chapter 2 of the book of Romans, we see how Paul opens up, and he says in verse 1, therefore you have no excuse. He says, you are anapologitos, meaning you are without legal defense as well. And now who is Paul talking to? He says, O oh man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice, there's that word again, prasso, practice the very same things. And so now Paul is turning his guns towards those who are self-righteous. Maybe they are self-righteous Gentiles who have come out of paganism, out of heathenism, to acknowledge the one God, and so they look down on, on paganism, and they think that they are, they are free from the wrath of God, and it can also include Jewish people who look down on Gentiles and on idolatry and say, oh, I'm not like those people in, in chapter 1. And so, yes, God, you should... You should hurl your punishment and wrath down on that group of people. But of course, I am much better than they are. And now Paul is turning towards the self-righteous man who judges others, and he says, you have no excuse. You are without legal defense before God because you practice, you do the same things. So just as back in verse 32 of chapter 1, it said they they not only practice these things that deserve death under the decree of God, but they uh, give approval to those who practice them. Now he says in verse 1, You also, you self-righteous judger of all, you practice the very same things. In verse 2, Paul goes on and he says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. That word yet again, prasso. It's in truth, it's according to truth that God judges all human beings, whether you are unrighteous or self-righteous. You don't know that you're unrighteous before a holy God. In verse 3, Paul continues, he says, Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? And I emphasize that word you because it's emphasized in the Greek that you will escape 
the judgment of God, you're not going to get away with it either. You will not escape God's righteous judgment either. So Paul is lumping everybody in the same boat, in the same situation under the holy wrath of God. In verse 4, he continues, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? The reason God does not destroy us immediately the second we're born as sinners under his wrath is because of his kindness and his forbearance and patience. That he is leading his elect people, the elect sheep of Jesus, to repentance ultimately. So he's giving us time to repent. Verse 5 says, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And so we see here that who is the your and the you and the yourself? That is the self-righteous man. And Paul calls the self-righteous man hard-hearted and having an unrepentant heart. And so you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. What does that mean? I like to use the analogy. It's like Paul is talking here about a bank of wrath. And we are all continually making deposits into that wrath bank. And our accounts are are slowly getting larger and larger and larger. We are storing up for ourselves more and more wrath that we will receive on the day of wrath. I think that that day, that word day should have a capital D because that's talking about the final day, the day of judgment. But it will be a day where God outpours his wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed because the judgment of God is, is not a temper tantrum. It's righteous judgment. He is a holy God, and we have sinned against him. And so we are deserving of his punishment, which is according to truth. It is a righteous punishment that we are well deserved. And so even the self-righteous man who doesn't even realize that he is in the same boat as those idolaters and sexually immoral and, and all those evil people in chapter 1, He is still, because of his unrepentant heart, refusal to bow the knee before God, and that hardness of heart, because of that, he is storing up wrath for himself on the day of wrath. And we should think very deeply about this verse. This verse is a key verse here. Because this is talking to us. We can all read chapter 1 and we say, Yeah, there's a few things that apply to me, maybe two or three things that make me a little nervous. But really, I'm I'm not as bad as as the people that God is talking about through the Apostle Paul there in chapter 1. It doesn't really apply to me. I'm a much better person than those guys over there. But now chapter 2 is talking directly to us, to everyone who thinks that they're better and not in the same boat as the people in chapter 1. We are hard-hearted people apart from Christ. We were unrepentant. And we were storing up wrath for ourselves on the day of God's wrath. We deserve God's wrath along with everybody else. In verses 6 to 11, Paul now describes what the situation is on the day of judgment. This is what's going to happen. And Paul describes it in neutral terms. So we should we should pay close attention to here. But it is in the context of what Paul has been saying in chapters 1 and 2. So Paul's describing the day of judgment. He says, God will render or repay to each one according to his works. According kata ta erga autu. So according to the works of him. According to his works. We see in the NIV that it's in a quote. We see the NASB, which puts quotations from the Old Testament in capital letters. Um, And so what those translations are pointing to is that Paul is quoting probably from Psalm 62, verse 12. God will repay to each one according to his or her works. And verse 7 to 10 describe this. It says, To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, 
but obey unrighteousness. It's that word again, unrighteousness, adikia. But obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath, again, orge, and fury, thumos. And Paul repeats himself in verses 9 and 10. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. So we remember that construction from chapter 1, that the gospel is for all those who believe, first for the Jew and also for the Gentile or for the Greek. And Paul uses that same thing here, that the Jews are first in line to receive the gospel, but the Jews are also first in line to receive God's judgment and wrath. Verse 10, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. And so Paul is, is giving us a neutral presentation of the day of judgment. To all those who do good and obey God's holy law, they will receive eternal life. They will be justified before God. Well, to all those who disobey and do evil and do unrighteousness, they will receive the wrath of God. But let's look back at verse 7. I think there's a very key little phrase here. It says, to those who by patience, to those who by patience in well-doing or good doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. By patience. The NASB says, by perseverance. The KJV says, by patient continuance. I like that. And I also like the NIV, that by perse persistence, rather, by persistence in doing good. So what does that mean? Well, the Greek says, kath hupomanein. That literally means according to endurance. According to endurance. So you have to persist. You have to patiently continue. You have to persevere in doing good to attain eternal life. Can anybody do that? Paul has been showing how everyone is under the wrath of God for their sin, whether they are sinful idolaters who don't care about God or the self-righteous God-fearing one who is still hard-hearted and unrepentant and storing up wrath for themselves. Everyone's under God's wrath. Why? Because we cannot do good by patience or persistence or perseverance. In the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 27, uh, which is a review of the law of God, uh, Moses instructs the, the Israelites when they enter into the promised land, half of the tribe of it, tribes of Israel are to stand on one mountain and the other half are to stand on another mountain and they are to proclaim the blessings and the curses of the law. And in chapter 27, the curses are recited and it says, Cursed is everyone who does X, and all the people say, Amen, let it be so. Cursed is everyone who does Y, the people reply, Amen, let it be so. Cursed is everyone who does Z, and the people reply, Amen, let it be so. And at the end of that list, it says in Deuteronomy, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. The Apostle Paul picks up on that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. And he says, No one will be justified in God's sight by observing the law, for as it is written, quoting Deuteronomy 27, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the law. And the two key words in that verse are continue and everything. In order to attain eternal life, in order to gain glory and honor and immortality, we have to do good by perseverance, by persistence. We have to continue to do everything written in the book of the law. One slip up, one mistake, one failure, one little sin puts us under the wrath of a holy God. And so even though this is a, a neutral presentation of the day of judgment, we understand immediately that none of us can actually attain to eternal life because we cannot continue to do everything written in God's holy law. We will fail. We will sin against him. And so really, we are in this category described in verses 8 and 9. 
We are the self-seeking ones. We do not obey the truth. We obey unrighteousness. And so we will receive wrath and fury. We will receive the tribulation distress for every human being who does evil. Verse 11 says, God shows no partiality. God does not show favoritism because everyone is in the same boat. As we finish up the last few verses, verses 12 to 16, Paul says this now, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. What does he mean by that? Well, in the first instance, he's talking about Gentiles, all who have sinned without the law. The Gentiles have not heard the law of God. So they sin. When they sin, they do so apart from the law. And Paul says, on that day, they will also perish without the law. That word perish, it's like Paul saying, they will be put down like a rabid animal or like a brute beast. They will be taken back behind the woodshed and shot in the head. They will perish without the law. But Paul now turns to Jewish people and he says, and all who have sinned under the law, Jewish people who have the law, they know the law, they've heard the law of God, and they sin under the law, what will happen to them? They will be judged by the law. So what does that mean? That means that they will have due process. They will have a trial. But at the end of the trial, the judge will declare them guilty and they will be executed. And so really, the end result is the same for both. Whether you are a Gentile sinning apart from the law, you will be put down like a brute beast with a bullet to the head behind the woodshed, or you will be judged under the law, according to the law. You will have the due process of a trial, but in the end, the judge will still declare you guilty and you will be executed. So the end result is the same. Destruction, hell, the lake of fire, under the eternal condemnation of a holy God. Paul says in verse 13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And here we see how Paul says, Hearers and doers. And that's even a special construction in the Greek. Doers is poietai. That is someone who continues to do it. It's like a jo job or a role that you continually do. You have to be a doer of the law, not just a hearer of the law. Because to be a hearer of the law, it can go in one ear and out the other. You have to actually put it into action. But as we saw, according to the law itself, you cannot fail even once or you are under the wrathful condemnation of God. Paul says, and he continues here, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves even though they do not have the law. Verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. And so Paul's talking about that even the Gentiles, they don't have the law, they haven't heard the law, but they do have a conscience. God has written his law upon every heart of every human being, so that we know what right and wrong is instinctively. The law is written on our hearts and the, uh, our consciences testify together with that law written on our hearts so that even if Gentiles have not heard the law, they are still under the judgment of God. And verse 16, our last verse says, On that day, again, a capital D, talking about the final day, the day of judgment. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. For it is Jesus Christ who will sit on that throne of judgment, and he will be the one to give the, the guilty verdict to all those who have rebelled against God. He will give the not guilty verdict to all those who have placed their, their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ and in his cross to save them and to wipe away their sin. And so this is the day of wrath. This is the day when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, when it will be poured out upon all the idolaters and the sexually immoral and, and the liars and the gospers and those who disobey their parents. But it will also be an outpouring of the wrath that has been stored up by self-righteous, hard-hearted, unrepentant people. Everyone is in the same 
situation under the condemnation of God. And that's why we need a Savior. If we never come to the point of despairing of ourselves and and coming to that point of hopelessness, that how can we possibly be saved from the wrath of God, from hell and from the lake of fire, then we will never look up for a Savior. If we all if we think that we're doing all right already, if we think that we are good with God, that we have peace with God, we don't realize that God's wrath is hanging over us, and the gospel will not be good news to us. But when we understand the situation that we are in, that we are sinners, hard-hearted, unrepentant, under God's wrath, then we cry out in hopelessness and despair, Lord, save us. What can we do to be saved? And the answer is we can do nothing. We can only trust with empty hands, trust in the cross of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice to save us.